Welcome back, scholars. This is Lecture 8. Uh, we're covering Chapter 8, Cognition and Intelligence. So uh, what we'll do for this chapter, uh, we'll split this chapter up into two parts. Uh, the first, first part, um, we'll, we'll discuss Chapter uh, Cognition, which is the first part of uh, kind of the biggest part of what we do um, with, with uh, thinking, and problem solving, and uh, decision making. And then we'll also talk about intelligence for Part 2, uh, which will cover um, you know, how we measure intelligence, uh, how we use intelligence to compare ourselves to others. And, you know, is intelligence uh, hereditary or is it based on um, the environment we grow up in? So we talk about uh, nature versus nurture. And uh, so we'll discuss those things in part two. Um, but we will, again, uh, focus primarily on cognition uh, in part one. Um, this question is directly tied to part two. Talk about, uh, again, environment and how it might affect our intelligence. And we talk about this um, a little bit. Uh, and the debate is really, really important because we're talking about, is there a way that we can improve uh, the potential for learning for children, um, especially for young people who, who may not have uh, the best uh, environment growing up? And so does that play a role affect uh, our intelligence and then does it affect our potential for learning and uh, there is a uh, research that does show that our environment uh, along with genetics plays a big role and affects our intelligence uh, and our potential for learning the, the more stimulating our environment um, the uh, the greater the likelihood that we're going to uh, develop the skills that are necessary to succeed academically and so we want to make sure that uh, everyone um, has a has a really stimulating and nurturing environment that gives them opportunity um, to be their best self and achieve academically, so that in the future that they can reach their uh, their outcomes. Uh, that again, eventually become success, higher jobs, higher pay, better health, um, better quality of life. Okay, so again, we're going to break this uh, this this these two lectures into two. Uh, two parts. Uh, the first part will be um, how people think. Uh, so we'll talk about cognition. And the second part will be how well people think, which is uh, referred to intelligence. And uh, so we'll talk about three primary things, language, problem solving, decision making. And we're going to discuss them in the, the way that, um, again, we're going to talk about language, the acquisition of several theories uh, that speak to how we acquire language. We'll talk about different problem solving approaches. We'll talk about the barriers to problem solving. And then we'll also talk about um, some barriers to making quality decisions and why uh, we sometimes don't make the best decisions. Um, and we'll talk about um, some of those concepts that explain that, okay? Um, so again, unit one, we're gonna really talk about language um, and how we turn our thoughts into words. Um, we've talked about in the previous two chapters, we've talked about learning, we talked about human memory, and each of these um, chapters prior to this one uh, kind of work hand in hand with language acquisition. And um, when we talk about cognition and intelligence, you have to be able to learn uh, in order to, um, again, have some intelligence, and you have to have memory, human memory, in order to learn and then to uh, to practice cognition to then speak language. Okay, so we'll talk about that in, 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 in more detail here shortly. Um, but ever since the 1950s, um, there has been a debate about some of the key processes involved in language acquisition. And we'll talk about uh, three separate theories here. Um, but one of the first theories that we talk about is, you know, what we like to call as behaviorist. What is the behaviorist theory? Um, B.F. Skinner was a behaviorist. And so he liked to think that, you know, operant conditioning um, was something that we used. Uh, classical conditioning, operant conditioning was what we use to help uh, reinforce language and how we learn language. And said, he, he, he said that children learn language through imitation, uh, reinforcement, and other uh, established principles of conditioning. Where this falls a little short is we can't always re reinforce some of the other grammatical rules and, uh, and other things that we, uh, that we watch and, and are able to repeat. Right. Um, so, you know, if a child calls every four legged animal a dog before they're uh, introduced to other names for other animals that we can't really always um, 
reinforce that or, you know, the reinforcement of saying go instead of went. Right. A lot of those things uh, can't be reinforced all the time. There's so many grammatical rules, past tense, present tense. And so all of those can't be reinforced. And that's one hit against behaviorism. One hit for uh, behaviorists is the imitation piece. Right. Uh, we pick up accents. We pick up uh, different colloquialisms, different slang. Um, just based on being around certain people. So there is a interaction between our environment and the experiences we have and the uh, imitation and the conditioning that we experience in our environment that helps us to acquire language, but it does not explain everything, right? And so that's where some of the other theorists come in. Um, but again, some of the vocalizations are shaped by reinforcers uh, until they are correct, right? So maybe you uh, are saying things in past tense in a, in a correct grammatical rule. And so maybe you are being corrected by your mom and reinforced until you are saying things that are correct. But um, with so many grammatical rules, uh, it's almost impossible to correct every little incident. And so um, the other theories explain why we might be able to uh, acquire language in a different way. Okay. The nativist theory is, along with the interactionist theory, help to kind of give us a, a broader sense or a broader, broader view of how we acquire a language, right? The behaviorist theory is not completely wrong, um, but there are, other, are some instances where it doesn't and cannot explain everything. And the nativist theory, made popular by Noam Chomsky, says that children learn the rules of language through a, uh, an innate device or mechanism that facilitates the learning of language. And this uh, structure in our brain is responsible for us learning those rules of language. And it's, um, that structure is... Uh, tuned for us to have um, the grammatical rules, the present tense, the past tense, those types of things, and make and, and allow us to be able to understand those things and learn those things a lot easier because we have a structure in our brain to do so. And we have a, what we call a nat native uh, or a natural propensity to develop language because of that structure in our brain. The interactions theory kind of combines uh, the behaviorist and the nativist theory to explain that the biology, which is, you know, the nativist theory that language acquisition device and our experiences through um, the behaviorist theory contribute to language development. And we are hardwired, we are wired to recognize sound patterns and to make up human languages based on some of the interaction between the biology and the physiology of our, our, our bodies and uh, the experiences that we have um, through the interactions and these social interactions that we have with people around us, not only at home, but even at school. Uh, we pick up a lot of our accuracy of language by interacting and communicating with other peers and our parents. And so that kind of gives us uh, the interactionist theory that explains and helps us to get a, a more robust look at how we acquire language. Um, one of the other um, debates is how does bilingualism or you know multilingualism, how does that affect um, our cognition? And, you know, we, we talk about the importance of, you know, bilingualism and how it might help us to be more marketable in the marketplace um, when we're looking for a job because our, our world is a lot more globalized. Everyone is a lot more intertwined and interspersed with one another. And we interact with um, different races and ethnicities all the time. And uh, since our organizations are more global, um, we're going to be interacting with individuals who may not speak our primary or main language. And so having an learned a new language or another language is important for communication with people who may not be um, in the United States. Um, one, of, one of the biggest disadvantages for being bilingual is there's a slight handicap in the processing speed uh, and your verbal fluency of maybe that second language. But over the course of time, as you learn the language, you do work, become more fluent, um, especially if you speak it uh, more often. And if you start a lot younger um, with younger children, um, and it may be a lot easier for them to learn two languages at the same time versus uh, them learning a language later on in life because of the uh, a lot of the rules that we've learned and formed um, are kind of hardwired and uh, it's a lot a little more difficult to uh, to learn new languages as we um, we think about um, being bilingual. Um, some of the advantages for being bilingual, uh, you know, those who are bilingual score moderately higher uh, than monolinguals on measures of attention control. Uh, working memory capacity, abstract reasoning, and certain types of problem solving. And it allows us to be able to hold two things in our brain at one point or one time and, and be able to switch our attention 
um, from one day to the next um, pretty seamlessly. And uh, again, that helps with cognition. It also may, uh, and research has also shown that it also may protect uh, against age-related cognitive decline, like uh, some sorts of, some types of dementia, uh, like uh, Alzheimer's. So it might also uh, delay the onset of Alzheimer's and other types of dementia, okay? Um, but research has also shown that, you know, bilinguals and monolinguals are pretty similar uh, in the course and the rate of their language development, no matter um, when they start to learn. I mean, there's a, uh, there's a learning curve, there's a very shallow learning curve that takes place. Uh, when you're learning a new language because you're learning all the different intricacies of, um, you know, grammatical rules, learning the past tense and present tense and, you know, past participles and learning about um, prepositions and all those different things uh, in other languages. Um, and, you know, we talk about um, the relative, relative relativist theory where our language uh, has a, uh, an interaction and an influence on our thoughts. That also plays a big role because, again, as we talk about in the, in the next couple of slides, you know, the words that we have for certain things here uh, in America in, in an English language may not be in other languages because of uh, our culture here in the United States. Um, but linguist, linguistic relativity uh, speaks at the hypothesis that language does determine the nature of our thoughts. And uh, Benjamin Lee Wharf speculated that different languages lead people to view the world um, very differently. Um, so when we think about uh, different types of precipitation. Um, those in uh, Africa have never experienced snow, so they don't have terms or uh, words for snow, right? So the way they look at their world may be a lot different. Um, you know, we had a, a class, we had a, a student say that, you know, she's from Nigeria, and uh, they said that it'd be really, really cold in the United States. And so in the summertime, she came and she thought it was going to be cool. And so she was wearing her winter coat here in the United States during the summertime in Alabama. And we all know that in Alabama, summertime is extremely hot and humid. Um, but again, uh, there's a disconnect in how you think about uh, your, you know, the language barrier that might uh, cause um, some uh, a hiccup in how we interpret what you know hot means and and what they mean by being cold in the United States doesn't mean it's cold everywhere. Um, um, certain indigenous peoples in certain parts of the country have different terminology and words for. Um, the certain precipitations. Um, so when you think about someone from, you know, regions of Alaska and other cold regions, you know, they don't have the same words um, that we have for snow, you know, vocabulary words for snow. Uh, the Inu Inuit and Yupik people have about 40 to 50 words for snow. However, the Scots uh, in Scotland have about 421 uh, different vocabulary words for snow, just based on the different type of snow, the different forms of snow. Um, and again, it again talks and kind of supports um, the hypothesis that we do and, and the language that we do have does form uh, our thoughts and the nature of our thoughts. Um, but again, it is really, you know, it's really subject to, you know, considerable research and we're continuing debate, right? A lot of the things, especially with language is still kind of a mystery. And so we're trying to determine um, you know, some of the regions in our brain that might influence and, and does this actually matter, right? Does it actually, uh, this is hypothesis actually being supported by research and data and um, evidence is favoring it in a way and the other, other research uh, does not. But, you know, we're looking to see if there is a consistent uh, finding of research that says that um, linguistic relativity um, is a thing. And, you know, when we talk about the perception of color in different degrees of the world and how we look at um, some some uh, colors and you know some colors um, like blue. Um, some other cultures have different variations and vocabulary words for the, the word blue or the color blue, um, just based on different shades. When we look at blue, you know we might have light blue, dark blue, but blue is blue, right? And so um, you know we have a limited amount of it. What we see uh, might be different based on our language. Okay. So problem solving, this is unit two. Um, so we're in the search of solutions. What is a problem? Right? What is a problem? I'm gonna go through a few examples. I want you to think through these um, and uh, I'll, I'll you know, uncover the answer uh, after a while, but if you need to pause the answer to kind of think through it, um, please do so that you, uh, you have an opportunity to answer these questions. Um, but it says, in the Thompson family, there are five brothers and each brother has one sister, okay? 
if you count Mrs. Thompson, how many females are there in the Thompson family, right? So you have to, again, think through the information, think through uh, the relevant information and the irrelevant information to answer the question. And the answer you should have gotten, you can pause the video if you need to, but the answers that you should have gotten should be two, right? Each brother has one sister, right? And if each brother, if they're all brothers, they all have the same sister. And that one sister is that one daughter, the sister to each of the brothers. And the mom is the second female uh, in the family. Here's another one. It says 15% of the people in Huntsville, Alabama have unlisted telephone numbers. Okay. You select 200 names at random from the Huntsville phone book. How many of these people can be expected to have unlisted phone numbers? Okay, so you think through that, think through the information that was presented, and then um, the answer will be um, provided on the next slide. Okay, the answer is none, right? It says 15% of the people in Huntsville have unlisted telephone numbers. So you select 200 names from Huntsville phone book, right? If you're selecting 200 names at random from the Huntsville phone book, that means those numbers are listed, right? So you won't have any unlisted phone numbers because you won't find any people with unlisted phone numbers because they're not in the phone book, right? So it's none. There's a lot of irrelevant information. We'll talk about the barriers to problem solving. That's one um, that we'll speak on, but irrelevant information is one of those keys uh, that we have to hone in on when we're solving problems, okay? Um, but when we talk about problem solving, um, problem solving is any active effort uh, to discover what must be done to achieve a goal. Um, that is not readily attainable. If the goal is easily attainable and readily attainable, it's not a problem, right? So it has to be uh, not readily attainable for it to be a problem that we must solve. And you must go beyond just the information that's given oftentimes to overcome some of the obstacles to reach goals that, again, are not readily attainable. Um, so you might have to think outside of the box. We'll look at a few examples, um, you know, some of those barriers to problem solving where you have to think outside of the box sometimes in order to get to the solution that you want to find. Um, Jim Greeno, he proposed three classes of problems. And again, this list is not, not exhaustive, but these are three primary problems that we face um, pretty often throughout our life um, that when mastered uh, allows us to be a lot better problem solvers. Um, one of the, the first problem, uh, the first class of problem that we face is uh, the problem of inducing structure. So again, discovering the relationships among the parts of the problem. So analogies are good ways to talk about inducing structure in a particular problem. And so it says merchant is to sell as customer is to blank, right? And then you lawyer is to client as doctor is to blank. So if you think about it, when we talk about merchant is to sell, right? The customer is buying things. So a customer buy, right? The second one says lawyer is to client as doctor is to patient, right? So you have a client as a lawyer and you have a patient as a doctor. So those are the analogies that you have to use to, to fill in those blanks. We also use arrangement or problems of arrangement to arrange parts that satisfy some criteria. And these anagrams help us to think through rearranging words. And one of the keys that we have is we're able to store things in our memory we talked about human memory, we're able to store them and kind of rearrange things in our mind to uh, get the words to be English words. So if we're looking at the uh, the word here, right, um, this word should be water, W-A-T-E-R, right? And this word right here would probably be joker, J-O-K-E-R, right? So those are English words, uh, and, you know, that's how those things work. Problems of transformation is the last of, of the three classes of problems. So it says complete the sequence of transformations to reach a specific goal. So it says suppose that you have a uh, 21 cup jar, um, a 127 cup jar, and a three cup jar. It says drawing and discarding as much water as you like. You need to measure out exactly 100 cups of water. How can this be done? Okay, so I want you to think through it. I'm going to show you the uh, the solution. But when you're doing these types of problems, you know, when you're doing these types of problems, it's important that you kind of just look about 
look at the what, what is the goal, right? What is the goal here, right? So I know I have to get to 100 cups. I have 127 uh, cups of water here, 21, and then three, right? So I'm just going to give you the equation, and you and you'll be able to solve it. So the equation that is used for this transformation is going to be B, okay, minus A. Minus two C, right? So let's do the math. So we got 127 minus 21 minus two times three. So you got 127 minus 21, which is uh, 106. Two times three is six. So 106 minus six gives me 100. All right, so you can do the math if you need to. But this is one of the equations that we use to solve that problem, right? So again, you just have to make some transformations and then transform the numbers to what you need. Uh, to reach the goal of, again, 100 cups of water, okay? So that's just a uh, an example. Um, but again, problem solving, really, really important. And so you got to be willing to, to do the math, think through some of the problems in a different way so that you get the solutions that you want, okay? Let me go back to my laser pointer, okay? All right. So... We looked at some of those problems before, some of the word problems, and uh, you know there are some barriers to effective problem solving. And let's talk about a few of them. Uh, one of the most important ones is, uh, and it's done a lot in uh, standardized testing, where they provide you with a lot of random information that has no. Uh, it's not going to really help you solve the problem, right? Um, so irrelevant information is when you figure out what information is relevant and what is irrelevant before proceeding, right? So if we go back to the phone book example, it said 15% of uh, people in, in Huntsville, right, have unlisted phone numbers in the telephone book, right? And they say at random, they, they, they select 24, 200 names at random out of the phone book, right? But those are names that are listed in the phone book. And so then when they ask you how many names are, again, uh, selected out of the phone book that are unlisted, there are none because those numbers are not listed at all. And so you have to get rid of all the irrelevant information from the relevant information, and you'll you'll realize that it's none because of all the irrelevant information that was provided. Functional fixedness is when you perceive an item only in the terms of its uh, most common use, and you're overlooking obscure, little noticed features of different problems that you're given, right? I don't know if you've ever seen, but in some movies, you have people that are trying to start a car, right? So they don't have a key. And what they do is they get a screwdriver, they stick it in the ignition, they turn it, it turns on, right? So someone who would have functional fixedness wouldn't think to use a screwdriver to turn uh, the ignition over, right? But those who know that the screwdriver can be used in that way, Right. Or using something that's not necessarily a ladder, like a chair or a table to stand on to grab something that you need up, to, up top. Right. So, again, using some flexibility and changing your perspective is part of not having functional fixedness. But if you do have functional fixedness, then you're really, really rigid and your flexibility is uh, hampered. Right. Uh, mental set is persisting and using problem solving strategies uh, that have worked in the past. Right. There are going to be some things that you encounter in your life that at one point in your life, you're able to use a strategy to solve an issue. Um, sometimes we, we try to use the same solutions um, for people. Maybe we have a conflict with one of our relatives. And, you know, you think the last time I, I, I did it this way and we were able to resolve the issue that we had. And it's a similar problem, but we were able to resolve, resolve the issue. However, this person is very different. The new situation you have, this person is very different. And this solution that you tried, um, it does not work. The strategy you tried is not working because, again, the people are very different in the way they 
the way they move, the way they perceive the world, right? So we can't be stuck in this mental set. We have to change our strategies. Even though they may have worked in the past, they may not work now. We have to be open to uh, other strategies that might be able to work for the situation. When we talk about rigid thinking, it kind of goes uh, in tandem with mental set, right? When a mental set interferes with effective problem solving. So again, when you can't get past uh, finding another strategy um, to resolve a problem, then you have what we call rigid thinking. And rigid thinkers are no fun to be around because they slow down progress, right? We need individuals in the room who can think outside of the box, who can see a different perspective and be a little more creative. And those who are more rigid don't open their eyes up or open their mind up to different perspectives. They're not really open-minded. Uh, someone who is rigid thinking or closed-minded individuals, okay? Um, the, the last thing we'll talk about is the unnecessary constraint. We'll, we'll go through a few of these problems so you'll kind of as demonstrations for you. Um, but again, you assume constraints on problems that do not exist. I tell you to solve a problem. I don't give you any major constraints and you place a constraint on them without without me having to do so. You do it, do it yourself. And that again, thinking inside a box that's not even there, okay? So here is a problem uh, that shows an example of irrelevant information, right? So it says, as I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. Every wife had seven sacks, every sack had seven cats, every cat had seven kits. How many were going to St. Ives? So all of the irrelevant information, I'm gonna highlight here, I'm gonna go to my hand. I'm a highlighter here. So all of the irrelevant information is here, right? I don't, I don't really care. Excuse me. It's all here. I don't really care about all the seven sacks, all the seven cats, all the all that. I don't care about that because all I'm saying is I was going to St. Ives. I met a man. I met him on the way. Right. That means I ran into him on the way. That means I'm continuing to go to St. Ives. He's going in the opposite direction. So how many people were going to St. Ives? One. One person was going to St. Ives. And that's that's kind of what we should be doing, right? That's how that's how we should think about it. Okay? That's the first one. All right? To see eliminate all the other irrelevant information. The man, the, all of his bars were going in the opposite direction. So one man was traveling. Okay? It says you were given a candle. And this is an example for functional fixedness. Says you were given a candle, a box of matches, a box of thumbtacks. How can you fix the candle to the wall and light it? You see all the, the components here. You got the candle, you have uh, the box of thumbtacks, and you have the box of matches right here. How would you do it? Right? You, you're able to, and again, your cognition is allowing you to rearrange these things to reimagine, to imagine how it might look attached. Uh, to a wall, right? How do you fix a candle to the wall, right? Uh, the solution, um, you can pause it and think through it, but the solution is you have your box, you have your tacks, your thumbtacks, you use those thumbtacks to attach it to the wall, you place the candle on the inside of the box, you light the candle, boom, you solve the problem, okay? Here is another problem that we run into, um, and this is an example of the unnecessary constraint problem, right? Uh, I've given students over and over time to, to solve it. Um, I think I've had a couple of students solve it. I know many of you may have seen this problem in other, maybe on TikTok or on social media, but how might you solve it, right? Here is one way, and I'll show you, okay? Um, you can pause it, try to solve it on your own, but here is one way you can do it, right? You go up, right? You go over, right? And you go down here. There you go. Oh, you can only use four lines. You shouldn't be re raising your pencil up. This is just be four lines and all of the lines and all the lines have to have a line through them. Right. So this that's the solution. Right. That was the solution to that. Okay. But again, many of you might have just let me get my uh, pointer. Many of you may have just tried to stay in the parameters and try to figure it out some type of way, right? But you can go outside of the box, think outside of the box. And this is one of the one of the nine-bot problems. 
it's one of those puzzles that uh, kind of created that that saying, thinking outside of the box. Sometimes you have to go outside of this box, right, in order to solve the problem. And so being creative, being open-minded allows you to solve problems uh, in a more effective and more efficient way. Okay. So here are some approaches to problem solving, all right? Um, you have insight, trial and error, heuristic, forming sub goals, searching for analogies. Um, many of you, the, many, many of these you do already, right? Insight is just kind of a sudden discovery of, of a correct solution. Um, you, you do a lot of trial and error, you know, um, you try to try something out, it doesn't work, you get kind of close one time, doesn't work, but eventually you get to that last problem and man, now I got it, right? It just happens. The sudden discovery of the solution. And we've all had that kind of that light bulb eureka moment um, that happens and one of the best feelings ever when you get that insight on something that you've been trying to solve for a long time. Uh, trial and error, again, trying different possible solutions sequentially to discard that, you know, those that are in error until one of those works. And one of the disadvantages to this is if you have a limited number of solutions, it's going to work for you. But if those solutions are unlimited, then trial and error is likely not the, the best route to take. You might want to try a different strategy. Um, to, to solving that problem. Um, heuristics is another, right? Um, a guiding principle is just a rule of thumb. It's kind of a, uh, a shortcut that we use. We use a lot of shortcuts in, in decision-making and, and problem-solving, but we use uh, these to solve problems and make decisions. Those heuristics are kind of the shortcuts that we take. Uh, so again, if you find yourself sitting in a traffic jam, for example, Right. You may quickly consider other routes, taking one to get moving once again. Right. So one of the shortcuts or a different route helps me to keep keep going towards my goal. Forming sub goals. Uh, if you've ever had a, um, a big paper or big research project or paper, then you have to formulate some sub goals. Maybe you're you're writing different sections. You know, maybe one day you're writing the introduction. The other day you're writing the method section. One day you're writing the results and then you're writing the conclusion and then the discussion section, right? You're forming sub goals and there are intermediate steps toward a solution, right? There's an end goal and you have these sub goals in order to reach the end goal. Uh, and sometimes that's the best way to conquer something is by taking it in small chunks to make sure you, it's those small wins that make the biggest difference uh, when, you're, when you're trying to accomplish something really, really big and grandiose. Um, one of the other things that we do is we search for analogies, right? We use uh, the solution to a previous problem to solve it currently. And this is when it actually can work, right? Uh, my, my tire was flat. I found that I had a nail in the tire. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the same strategy. I'm going to go ahead, uh, search for the nail in the tire to see if I can solve the problem again. You know, I, that's, uh, it worked in the past. Let me use it again um, to see if it works. Okay. Uh, two other uh, approaches this problem solving, changing the representation of the problem. So changing what it looks like, how you envision the problem. Um, a lot of times when you're reading a word problem, they tell you to, to write out all of the components of the problem that you have and, you know, use a variety of ways to represent like diagrams, flow charts and graphs. So if you're able to look at the data um, that's written out and able to put it in a graph, it's a lot easier to see it. So if they ask you, you know, uh, was group A larger than group B? Looking at some of the data that they provide provides you may not be helpful, but if you put it in a table, if you put the table in a graph it, then you might be able to see a little easier that yeah, group A uh, is larger than group B, right? The last thing, um, taking a break, right? Incubation, allowing your time, uh, allowing your brain some time to kind of process it unconsciously, right? Again, this occurs when you have a new solution to surface because you previously just took a break, right? It was unsolved. You know, and then after the period of time, uh, constantly thinking about the problem, you got it, right? You just took a break, took a step back, maybe you went, went and got some lunch, and maybe you slept on it, and woke up the next morning, like, man, found got the solution, got the answer. So the incubation effect is that, uh, again, taking that break, and that's when the new solution surface, when you, you've taken a break to, uh, to let your mind think on it unconsciously. Because you can think about something so often, that you kind of put yourself in this mental set where you're just going around in circles, doing the same things over and over again. And sometimes when you take this time that incubation period, it kind of gets yourself out of that mental set and allows you to kind of rethink 
and open your mind to different problems or different solutions to, or different strategies, excuse me, to, to solve the problems. Okay. Um, cultural differences do exist um, in the cognitive styles we use to solve problems. Uh, and depending on what culture you're in, um, you have some cultures that are more communal. Uh, you have some cultures who are more individualistic, like in the U.S. and more Western cultures, but in the Eastern cultures, um, they're more communal. And so they might think of and may think of things a lot differently cognitively than we do. Um, and since, since they're more communal, uh, they have more of a holistic cognitive style and they focus on the context and the relationships among elements before they look at the individual objects and focus on the objects. Whereas uh, in the Western culture, we look at and focus on objects and their properties rather than the context. So we're looking at this ocean, right? So some of the holistic cognitive style, they're going to be looking at the entire sea, right? For someone in the analytic cognitive style, we're looking at this individual fish, trying to identify, okay, that's an angelfish, right? We're looking at this is this is coral reef, right? Uh, the water's blue, but the holistic cognitive style, we're looking at the entire picture. This is a, a beautiful, uh, scenery of uh, marine, right? They're looking at the entire scene and not just the individual picture or different components in that picture. Okay. So decision making, making choices, um, taking chances, uh, thinking about the consequences, right? Um, this is really important because when we talk about uh, learning, we talk about power of conditioning. Um, when you make a decision, there are certain consequences that come from it. And our decision-making uh, plays a big role. Do we, do we go through all the options? Do we go through all the alternatives to make the best decision? Or do we just take shortcuts? Do we use heuristics a lot of times uh, to take shortcuts and to make decisions? Uh, we'll talk about that. Are we able to? Are we not? Um, uh, do time strength, strength, time constraints affect us? Does uh, the pressure of you know, trying to be right um, you know, kind of place constraints on us? Uh, so we'll talk through uh, some of those major issues. Okay. Um, so what happens when we try to make a decision? What is that process? Right? Uh, decision making is just a process of just evaluating alternatives and then making a choice uh, among them. Right? If you ever went to go shop for a car, or, uh, you're grocery shopping for, uh, or maybe you're shopping for your favorite uh, pair of shoes. Right? You have all of these different alternatives and you're just making the choice uh, making your choice among them, right? So we have to be mindful of that. That's the process of it, right? You have these different options. You're at a restaurant. You're making a decision of what you want to eat, right? So many alternatives. Let me make a choice. Uh, but most people try to be systematic, right? And rational in their decision making. But there is a theory that says we have what we call a bounded uh, rationality. And it states that people use simple strategies, that focus on only a few facets of options. And this often results in irrational decisions that are less than optimal. And this says that, you know, as humans, we have so many different things going through our minds at one time. And our capacity to think, cognitive capacity, is limited in how much we can focus on one thing over another, right? And so we do use simple strategies and we use a lot of heuristics and shortcuts to just make the uh, the best decision we think is at the time. It might not be the most optimal, but it's good enough. So we make good enough decisions uh, to get us, get us, you know, to get us by, right? Uh, what if we were able to take time to think through every alternative and then try to make the optimal decision, right? It would take us forever uh, to make decisions. Um, so again, the simplistic of the strategies that we choose help us to uh, be more effective and efficient in our cognition and uh, our capacity to make decisions in a faster and more um, energy efficient way. Um, it says people have a limited ability process and to evaluate information on numerous factors of possible alternatives. So with that limited ability, we have to choose and select the most simple um, strategies that we have. Okay. Oftentimes we make decisions and they may not be optimal because we are in what we call choice overload. And this happens when uh, the potential for rumination and post-decision regret, right? When we have so many different choices, so many things to choose from, we make a decision and then 
ultimately we have a regret of the decision that we made. You had a restaurant, you're looking at the menu, you see everybody's ordered their food already, but there's so much to choose from. You choose the tacos because, yeah, you choose tacos all the time at other restaurants, and then you get the tacos and they aren't good at all. So you have this post decision regret, right? People also made the first decisions that they have two minute decisions. So they just go with what they know instead of trying and looking through the menu to see what may be the best option. Um, one of the other things that happens is when we have less confidence and satisfaction about our decision, um, that is because of choice overload, right? Because when you have so many decisions, you don't feel as confident when you make decisions um, because there's so many different options and it's kind of overwhelming uh, and creates an anxiety when we, when we have those. Um, choice overload also has to be determined. It depends on our decision factors, right? Do we have time constraints? Is there a lot of complexity and uh, comparability of the options? Uh, is there a presence of an option? You know, obvious best choice. When you're looking at a menu, there may not be an obvious best choice, especially if you like all types of foods. I'm a, I, I'm a foodie. I love all types of cuisine, and so it would be really difficult for me to find the optimal choice. Uh, because of that. Or maybe you go to a restaurant and all of your friends have been there several times, but this is your first time and everyone has ordered their food and you're like, ah, just let me get that, right? Um, so again, that less confidence, less satisfaction in your decision, right? But those who feel knowledgeable, those who have a knowledge of what's going on about the set of options are less vulnerable to choice overload. So if you've been to Chipotle, my first time in Chipotle was really overwhelming because they had so many ingredients to look at. And I'm like, okay, what goes what, right? Now, I'm, now I know I can go get brown rice and I can get the beans and I can get the vegetables. And if I don't get a meat, if I go meatless, I can get guacamole, right? So I know that I have some knowledge now. And so when I go in, I'm not vulnerable to choice overload because I know specifically what I can get, what I want, what combinations work. And that makes my opportunity, it makes my time there uh, a lot more enjoyable. Okay. Um, when we're making decisions, there's also uh, what we call decision fatigue. As your decisions increase, the number of decisions that you make over the course of the day increase, the quality of the decisions decreases, right? So as your quantity increases, the quality of your decisions decreases, right? So that's ha that happens all the time in, in various um, professions, especially uh, in high stress uh, professions, especially like nursing, doctors, or, um, you know, even sometimes with professors having to make decisions on, you know, what exam when I'm going, what, what, what am I going to teach on, you know, what, what assignments am I going to assign? All those things happen over the course of the day. And by the end of the day, you're making some really, really bad decisions, right? So psychi psychiatrist Dr. Lisa McLean says that after making many decisions, your ability to make more and more decisions over the course of the day becomes worse. And we make over 35 decisions per day, if you believe it or not, right? Everything that you do to decide to go to school or decide what you're going to wear, decide to uh, speak to him, to speak to her, or, you know, to eat chips or, you know, to turn your phone off, all those decisions that you make about 35 decisions per day. So by the end of the day, you're fatigued, right? And your decisions are uh, even worse um, as you get to the end of the day. And you have to think about, when we talk about brain development, think about someone whose brain isn't completely developed. So their decision-making process, uh, their prefrontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, their prefrontal lobe is not developed yet. And so they're already gonna be making poor decisions anyway. But then they're making a lot of decisions over the course of the day. Their decisions are going to be even worse um, for young adults or emerging adults. So I give I give people and young people grace because I understand that they're making a lot of decisions in their life. And in our in the average decisions that we make in a day are high. Right. So we have to be and help give people grace uh, because that mental overload does play a big role in um, the quality of the decisions that we do. Okay. One of the other things that we that we do when we're making judgments or trying to uh, make a 
a decision about something is we we use heuristics. We talked about make taking those shortcuts. That's one of the the approaches to problem solving, right? Um, when we're making a, a risky decision, right? We make choices under conditions of uncertainty. So sometimes when we don't know what we're what's ahead of us, maybe we're looking at the stock market. We want to invest money in a particular stock, but we're kind of uncertain as to in what way that that the stock is going to go. We just make uh, a risky decision, right, based on the uncertainty there. When you do the homework, understand what, what stocks are going to be performing well, then you can make a better decision. But when you have uncertainty, sometimes you just make a poor decision. The availability heuristic is a heuristic or a shortcut that we use uh, that kind of bases our probability of an event on the ease in which we have relevant instances come to mind. Right. There's an example I'll use next that'll kind of give, give you an example of what that is. Right. Um, representative heuristic is basing your estimated probability on an event, on how similar it is to the typical prototype of that event or person or circumstance. Right. So people assume an actual case is more representative than it actually is based on a prototype. OK. For instance. Um, some people think that we are at war more often than we are at peace, right? Because of the media coverage that covers different wars uh, across the world. But in actuality, we're in more peaceful states than we've ever been, right? Um, in the earlier 20th century, mid 20th century, that's when wars were, uh, you know, a lot more prevalent. Now, you know, we don't have a lot of casualties during war because of the technology, technological advances. Um, you know, the wars are a lot shorter now. Um, and the conflict that we have is a lot less, right? And peace, you know, we're probably in more peace proportionally than we are in war. And so that is kind of what we call a availability heuristic, right? Because we see it, there are instances that come to mind where we see, yeah, the conflict uh, with Ukraine and Russia, um, you know, we see other conflicts that that the United States may be in. But again, we're, we're at peace most of the time uh, until there is an actual conflict. Um, the gambler's fallacy is another uh, heuristic that we use uh, in judging probabilities. And, you know, here's an example, right? Which sequence is most likely for flipping a coin, right? You got option one and option two. Many of us are going to select option two because it looks more of it more. It looks more like, um, you know, something that we might see. You got three heads and three tails, right? But this is only three trials or six trials, excuse me, right? So we like to uh, apply short-term results to or long-term, excuse me, consequences to short-term results, right? So on average, yeah, you should see a 50-50 split, right? On average, since it's 50 percent. When you flip a coin, if you flip it 100 times, yeah, you should get around 50 heads and 50 tails. But if you only flip it six times, you might have a likelihood, there is a likelihood that you might get six tails in a row, right? Or you might get something like this, but I can't put the probability of kind of those long-term consequences on just six different trials, right? I have to, again, do more trials in order to uh, see more of the probability of that 50%. So here's an example of the availability heuristic. So meet Jill Doe, right? Which is more likely, Jill is an astronaut or Jill is a teacher, right? Many of us are going to select Jill is a teacher. Why? Because there are so many instances of individual teachers that we know or see around the world, uh, in our church, uh, at the you know at the grocery store. We see teachers more often than we meet an astronaut, right? So where the availability heuristic is, okay, I see uh, teachers all the time. They're the most available and, you know, I see them most often. What's the likelihood that you're going to meet an astronaut in the grocery store? Not very likely, right? You might in, in Huntsville because we're, you know, uh, the rocket city, city, excuse me, but you would also probably going to meet a teacher before you meet an astronaut just because teachers are more available and you probably say to you, is a teacher, okay? Here is an example of a representative, a representativeness heuristic, right? 
So me, Joe, me, Jim. If you think about these two individuals, which person do you think belongs to a wrestling ring? Right? Look at what we call a prototype, right? You got this big buff guy on the left, me, Joe. You got me, Jim. He's a little, he's, he's a little you know, a little more slim, right? So you're probably going to say Joe, right? Because he's a buff guy. He looks like the prototypical wrestler type. A lot of muscles. His clothes are really, really tight, right? Joe is, is the wrestler, and Jim might be a, a musician or an artist, right? But again, we use the representativeness or the stereotype, the prototype, to then be able to make decisions. And we do that all the time. We, we stereotype people all the time. It's not a bad thing. Um, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong, but this gives us an opportunity to see that representative heuristics are really, really important to make these decisions. Um, another issue that we have when we're um, using heuristics to solve problems is we ignore base rates all the time, right? So here's a, here's a scenario. It says Steve is very shy and withdrawn, and very really helpful, but with little interest in people of the world, or of the world of reality. Steve is a meek and tidy soul. He has a need for order and a structure and passion for detail. Okay? So do you think Steve is a salesperson or a writer? Many people um, will ignore the base rates, and we'll talk about the base rates in the next slide. But many people are going to say Steve is a, is a, a librarian, right? But the likelihood that Steve is a librarian is like 75 to 1, right? Because salespeople outnumber librarians 75 to 1 in the United States, right? So you would probably be more accurate in picking Steve is a salesperson because salespeople outnumber librarians 75 to 1. And when you think about a male librarian, then you might, the base rate might be even a lot higher, right? Um, or, you know, the, the odds might be a lot higher in favor of the salesperson, right? So we often ignore those probabilities uh, and base rates, even when they apply to things that we're involved in, right? So we have to be really mindful of those base rates. Uh, and so think about that as we start making decisions and making guesses about certain people. Um, one of the other things that happens when we make decisions uh, is we have what we call a conjunction fallacy. And here's an instance. It says, imagine you're going to meet a man who is an articulate, ambitious, power-hungry, willer dealer. Do you think it's more likely that he's a college professor or a college or a college professor or a college professor who's also a politician? Right? So the conjunction fallacy occurs when we estimate that the odds of two uncertain events happening together are greater than the odds of either event happening alone, right? So here's an introduction fallacy. These are the individuals who are college professors who are also politicians, right? So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You got about 27 individuals, right? So you got five of those persons are actually going to be politicians and college professors. But the greater majority, the 22 others, those are the ones who are actually college professors. So the likelihood that you're going to meet a man who is a politician and also a college professor is slim, slim chance, right? So the, the odds of getting just meeting a professor are higher than you just meeting a professor who is also a politician. So we have to, again, that conjunction fallacy. So we can attribute this powerful influence, again, to the representative heuristic, right? Because we think because, you know, he's power hungry, uh, he's a wheeler dealer, he's articulate, he's ambitious. We're like, oh, that's a prototypical uh, politician, right? But he could just be a business professor, right? Teaching, you know, M M M MBA program, right? So he's, he he's, might have been an ex-entrepreneur, right? He's a wheeler dealer, power hungry. They could also be professors as well, right? So that's the bunch of fallacy, you know, the odds of two uncertain events. These are really uncertain events. Uh, that happen together or greater than the odds of either event happening by themselves. All right. So when we talk about the evolutionary piece of making decisions, right, over the course of time, we we have so much to make decisions about, right? So theorists have, theorists have concluded, right? that when we think about human thinking, it is not as rational and as effective as 
we assumed it would be, right? According to a lot of evolutionary psychologists, we take a lot of shortcuts and we make a lot of irrational thoughts. And a part of why we do that is because we have a lot of things that are going on at one time. We have limited capacity, just like we learned in chapter seven, our working capacity, uh, our working memory, the capacity we have in our short-term memory is very, very short, right? So we have very limited capacity in how much we can store at one time, right? Um, you know, we are very, we, we vary in, in, in people and the, their amount of how they can store information and, and solve problems, right? Um, so the way we formulate problems uh, are different, but it has nothing to do with uh, adaptive problem solving. So sometimes when we're, you know, doing experiments in a lab and we're trying to see how people make decisions, a lot of this stuff is, um, you know, it's really artificial, right? But humans may not have the time. Humans may not have the resources and the cognitive capacity to make statistically optimal decisions. We don't have, we just don't have enough time. And, you know, in the lab, it might be a little easier. They can kind of take some time, make a decision, take, you know, look at the, the other options. But in real life, you got to make a decision or you're getting running over, right? So we don't always have the time. We don't always have all the resources necessary and all the information necessary to make the, the proper decision, right? If we had all the information, it'd be really, really tiring, and really exhausting to have all the information, have to sit down and contemplate everything that you're going to do. We oftentimes are going to make the best decision we can to get ourselves by uh, to the next decision um, that we're coming up on. Again, we make 35,000 decisions a day, so we have to make some of those decisions really quickly, and fast and frugal is the way to go. A lot of times we're making really quick shortcuts. Okay. Uh, fast and frugal heuristics have been shown to be sur surprisingly effective. Um, the stereotypes, the heuristics that we do use, though they might seem irrational, we oftentimes get it right, right? When we talk about the recognition heuristic, um, we talk about the representative heuristic, um, and, you know, availability heuristics, oftentimes we're going to get it right because, again, we use the heuristics we have. Here's another heuristic that we use where uh, when we select the the, between two alternatives based on, you know, some quantitative, quantitative, excuse me, dimension, right? And this also has to do with um, your representative or your availability heuristic, right? How familiar are you with different options and the alternatives that you're given? So it says, which city has more inhabitants, San Diego or uh, San Antonio, right? So if you were to just make a decision, most people are going to select uh, San Antonio. Why? Because Texas is a big state. Not many people think that California is as large a state as it is. It's actually a really, really big state in comparison to other states in our in our in the United States. But everybody looks at San Antonio. It looks like a really, really large landmass, and you know California looks really, really slim, and so it doesn't look as large. And so people would say San Antonio because it's in Texas. Uh, in, in actuality, San Antonio is slightly larger. Um, than San Antonio, I think it's like uh, 3.48, yeah, 3, yeah, 3.4 million people in uh, in San Antonio and about 3.3 million people in San Diego. So you're not off by much, but if you did select San Antonio, you are correct. Um, Geiger, uh, Geiger, Geigerinzer, um found quick one reason decision making strategies are as accurate um, and actually as more elaborate strategies than carefully weigh many factors, right? So sometimes you just make a decision based on kind of what you know and familiar with. And, you know, sometimes you're right. Sometimes you might be wrong, but um, sometimes it is pretty accurate when you make those decisions. Um, the dual process theory says that um, uh, fast and frugal heuristics and reason rule govern decisions do exist uh, side by side. So if we are given information and enough information to make decisions, we will use it. But if not, then we're going to use our best judgment and make the decision based on, you know, what we feel uh, is the best, uh, the best way forward. Okay. So we're going to stop there and uh, uh, we'll pick up on chapter or part two, excuse me, um, chapter eight. We'll pick up on that uh, in on part two. We'll talk about measuring intelligence, uh, how we measure intelligence, how we compare intelligences and just what intelligence means to, uh, to us as a, as a human race. Okay, you all have a good one.